While the bottom mold was off the plug, our next step was to extend the flange. We'll take a moment to explain why this was necessary. During the vacuum bagging process, the bag would actually be attached to the flange. Although three inches might have worked, a narrow flange makes it difficult to attach all the other vacuum bagging materials and the sealant tape. Since the mold had to be released anyway, we made the modification now so that the upper mold could be made with the wider flange already in place. You can see that the finished mold is about 5 eighths to 3 quarters of an inch thick. Fiberglass this thick takes time to trim even with the proper tools. To begin the modification, the flange was neatly trimmed using an air cutoff wheel. Notice that I'm wearing long sleeves and a respirator. Heavy fiberglass dust like this is best kept off the body and out of the lungs. Next, the mold was inverted on a waxed formica board where 5 inch wide strips of chopped strand mat were butted against the existing flange. These were added until they matched the height of the original. Then, wider portions of mat were overlapped onto the mold and the flange. When the flange matched the thickness of the rest of the mold and was continuous around the full perimeter, it was allowed to cure and then it was released from the formica. Once again, I used an air cutoff wheel and trimmed the excess from the edges of the widened flange. The surface of the new flange was very good. I still needed to use the belt sander to level the transition between the old flange and the new one. I wanted to mold the flange on the upper mold as smoothly as possible. Also, a smooth flange helps to reduce leaks during vacuum bagging. Except for hand sanding with finer paper and blowing away the excess dust, the lower mold was complete and ready for molding the top half. I waxed the bottom mold again before replacing it on the plug. This was in case any resin dripped into it while I was constructing the top mold. We had already removed all the clay residue from the plug and the waxed flange. With the bottom half of the mold returned to the plug, we are ready to document construction of the top mold half. The entire surface of the plug was thoroughly sprayed with three coats of PVA before being placed back into the lower mold. Clay has been added to the new extended flange to make it even smoother and the flange was waxed six times to ensure an easy mold release. More PVA was applied after the two were assembled so that the modified flange and exposed plug were completely coated. It will now be easy to duplicate the width of that flange into the top mold. This will be a polyester mold. A polyester mold can be used to pull polyester parts or epoxy parts as we will do. Polyester molds are typically preferred in most large applications for two reasons. First, polyester resin is considerably less expensive than epoxy resin. And second, polyester construction allows the use of chopped strand mats. Most grades of chopped strand mat cannot be used with epoxy resin. The first layer applied to the plug was the surface coat. This surface coat will create the surface of the mold from which all future parts will be pulled and is extremely critical. The quality of this layer is dependent upon the quality of the plug surface as well as the proper selection, catalyzation, and application of the gel coat used for the surface coat. We use the number 78 tooling gel coat. A good tooling grade gel coat is highly recommended for polyester mold surfaces. Tooling gel coat offers ongoing resistance to part release and has a minimum distortion. We filled several cups which could be catalyzed when they were needed. Scott measured the MEKP using an MEKP dispenser. This ensures a proper amount of catalyst is used for the gel coat. He mixed carefully to avoid creating hot spots in the gel coat. Using a two inch brush, he cut in the flange area with gel coat. It is easier to begin by brushing than spraying in an area like this. You need to cover that right angle where the flange meets the plug and make sure that the gel coat is applied evenly. Spraying directly into an area like this often results in runs or heavy sags. I'll come back and spray over it to level any brush marks, but I find this much more controlled. After the flange was covered, I was ready to spray gel coat over the entire surface of the mold. Using the gel coat cup gun, the remainder of the court was sprayed on. The brush strokes quickly disappeared when covered with the atomized gel coat. Gel coat is sprayed rather than brushed whenever possible. Even an experienced person will have occasional trouble with gel coat. Gel coat problems are usually a result of spraying too thick. Several thin passes are recommended. Yeah, that's at nine mils. That's just about right. I waited only long enough to catalyze another quart of gel coat before spraying it over the first. Notice how I used the cup gun. 
It is truly a gravity feed gun and the gel coat will run out the nozzle if it is tipped down. When it is extremely full, I keep the nozzle pointed upward until I have pulled the trigger and material begins to flow. Also, I do not release the trigger at the end of each pass like I would with a siphon type spray system. Instead, I move quickly and watch that I don't overlap the previous pass too much. A gel coat thickness gauge is used to measure the thickness. Heat checks in several places to make sure that there will be no thick or hot spots. It's like 14. It took a third quart to build the gel coat up to the desired 20 to 21 mils. The entire gel coat layer was allowed to cure until it passed the brush test. The gel coat may sit on the surface for no more than a few hours before proceeding. You need to wait until the gel coat passes the brush test, which is when it is cured enough to not move when brushed lightly with a dry brush. After it passes the brush test, however, you want to begin laying up your mold within two to four hours to avoid distortion and blistering problems, which you would not be able to see. If I have gel coat that has been left on a surface for more than four to six hours, I'll pick it off and start over. You really want a flawless mold, and if your gel coat is damaged, it's really difficult to repair. Next, we started reinforcing the mold. The schedule we followed was to apply two layers of mat followed by one layer of 10 ounce cloth. Then, we repeated the process four times until a total of 12 layers had been applied. We used polyester laminating resin. The first layer of reinforcement is also very important. It must be applied without trapping any air pockets. If an air bubble exists in this layer, the gel coat is unsupported and will collapse when the mold is put into service. As a rule, neither mat nor woven fabric can be expected to lay around a 90 degree or smaller angle without developing air pockets. To eliminate air pockets in the corner where the flange meets the plug, we pre-cut strips of mat in two sizes. We cut six inch wide strips of mat which match the width of the exposed flange. These strips can be laid into place easily and have nice cut edges on both sides. 